All right, we'll get started. So <coughs> we have a, couple, a few slides from lithography one, and then we'll get into exposure and optics. So again, term paper is due Monday. Submission is open. Rubric sample I'll definitely upload today. Rubric sample and the previous lecture. So this, I was working on it to fine tune it to make it more comprehensible for you guys. So I'll get that done. So we were at exposure, development, and after development, we do a big and we inspect. What are we looking for? Before we bake, we inspect. We are looking for defects, we are looking for tolerances, looking for quality of the resist, that it is completely gone from places where it's not supposed to be, and it is covering everywhere that it is supposed to cover. And that would mean that there can be places where photo resist fails. And Failing can be due to multiple, many, many different types of reasons. Some of the, the common defects are scratches on substrate, which would cause, cause less adhesion of resist at that place. It may be, there can be physical bubbles left in the resist itself. It can be dirt or any, what do you call, contamination that might have been left on the, on the substrate before we take the spin the resist. And so there is a whole long list of reasons why a resist or a pattern might fail, or what we call lithography run might fail. We look for edges that they are good, and once we are concerned about edges, there's an important part that the corners should also be good. So corners are important because there is much more going on on a, at a corner when we do the exposure. They might turn out to be something which is not exactly sharp. We'll see how we can do something about it. Critical dimensions are good. What is critical dimension? Revisit again. What is critical dimension? Feature size. Feature size? Yes, of course. Everything has a size and every feature has size, but what is CD? The smallest. The smallest? Distance that you can specify without using the distance. The smallest feature size you can? Yeah. In pattern. Pattern? Without losing the resolution. Without losing the resolution for a given technology. Right? So for a given technology means for a given mass, given wavelength, given resist. So all those things go into that process and then so we can make a very small feature, but our C D may not be the smaller size. C D is what as a designer I have designed the smallest feature on, on that on that mask, right? It may be still of course, it has to be bigger. It may be way bigger than what the smallest feature we can make with that technology. Right? But for me, in that mass, I have supposed my I have a line. Smallest line is three micron wide, and that is my CD. But with that with that technology, with that light, with that mass, with that resist, I may be able to make even smaller than that. But for that mass, my CD is three micron. So I'll. I have to know where to look for it, so I'll go looking for scanning for that smallest uh, feature I had. So if that comes out good, yeah, that gives lots of comfort that the bigger one would have come out good. So we make sure that they are CD that right, so there can be multiple shapes, multiple features, different variety of shapes of those features at that size, which we want to, them to come. Maybe circles, maybe lines, maybe distance between two lines. Not the line itself, but the pitch. But how often? Yeah. The mode is different from the CD. Okay. So CD is my my design. 
So right. CD is for mask and mode is for the wafer. That's how. No, CD is my design. For that mask set, my how smallest, what is the smallest feature size I have made? But node or that technology can define a smaller feature than that. But I may not want that that small of a feature in, in my mask set or my design of devices that I'm using. Right. So with a node, we make those devices or those gate lengths which are small. But that might not be the CD for all the masks levels. At a different mask set, my CD may be a different feature which is larger. So your CD is the smallest feature on the mask? On, the on that one lithography run that you are doing. On that one exposure that you are doing. So that's a critical dimension of that mask. So it's of the mask, not it's of the paper. When you say of the mass, I I say of the pattern because the mass may be stepped down ten times. So what comes out on the resist itself is my CD. On the mask, it may be ten times larger if I'm doing projection lithography and I'm scaling it ten times down. But I don't call it mask. I call the pattern that's been registered. So that brings the notion of the size on the mask and what we register. Okay. Right. So uh, we, we are going into registration because that's something which we do in alignment. We have to, in, when we are doing alignment, we, okay, we generally saw what is alignment. So alignment is bringing them together, right? But then once you push the pattern and, and exposure happens and we develop, then we have to see what have we got registered on the resist, which may be different because of the play in the machine. Right. So, okay, what gets registered on the resistor is your critical dimension. Right. But it's not necessarily the dimension of the device. It does not have to be. No, it may be at a different level. My, okay, gate level mask is the most critical, right? Where we have the smallest feature. There I'm really careful. But if I'm doing, I'm running uh, contacts, right, or, the, or interconnects, I'm more concerned uh -huh. about the line the what you call the integrity of the line in length that it reaches, it, it would be a lot bigger in, in width. But I would be more concerned that it's not, it's not metal is not thin at any place because that's going to failure result in a failure. I'll be concerned about overhangs of metal. We'll see what is overhang next right? so, which comes from the left off. So registration is within limits. So we, I align and then I. Then we expose and develop, and that process is registration, right? So I, it's like I have my, if you guys have seen those rubber stamps they used to use, especially in post offices, still they use some places. So you align it, but then what you get is, is registration may be a little out of place where you actually want it to be, right? We see that once we do those thumbprints, now it's all electronic, but a few years back, we had to put ink on and then we align our finger, but then once you push it, then you figure, oh man, it's registered, it's still a little away. So registration and alignment are two things. Of course, registration is, is a function of alignment. How good you, how good we align. So there we have to make sure it's within tolerances, within limits. So I have a question, why would bubble and scratch better for reduced quality? Like so, if I if I had a bubble and I did my exposure, my development, I would I will see some pictures also. How would these translate into defects? So, say I had a line which was supposed to go straight, and then I had a bubble in resist. So what I will end up is a line to translate into a line something like this. If I had this embedded bubble. And resist. So these are multiple types of defects. We'll see defects much more closely in next few times. So once we do hard bake, so we we remove all solvent. So we want it to solidify. That makes the adhesion really good. It makes resist uh, photoresist really hard for etching to withstand etching and reduces any holes that may be there in the, in the resist. 
pinholes is a term you might want to get used to. Pinholes are not just a feature of resist any film pre-deposit or grow or however we get on the surface. If it has mechanical defects, where we have very small cracks or openings, we call them pinholes. Pinholes are small round shaped defects which may go all the way or which may not go all the way, right? But what they're going to do is, when you do harsh treatment, they're going to become big and they're going to go all the way. So they're going to result into to defect at that place where resistance was supposed to cover everything. How do we look at, pin, how do we figure out there is a pinhole? Cavill electron microscope? Electron microscope, yeah, it can, but we don't know where to look for. It can be anywhere. It's a defect, right? So there's no specific place. You pass light through it. Pass light through it. And then see the reflection pattern. That uh, the pinhole may be smaller than the wavelength of the light itself. So, but the different pinholes and different materials would require different techniques, how do we figure out for the defect of pinholes, right? So for resist, there is obviously no way to find pinholes. It would come out only as a defect once we are done with the treatment, whatever it is supposed to do, right? In etching, it will come out a small bit in the substrate, right? Because it was, if I had this opening for etching and I removed my whatever was their silicon all the way, right? This would result into small pit at the surface, right? So, but, so that will tell me the resist at that point was not completely intact, so there was pinhole. The defect smaller, too small that even a electron microscope it would be almost impossible to find out. Yes, it, I'm not saying my electron microscope cannot look at small features, but you don't know where to look for. Right, unless those pinholes are everywhere. So, hard bake in this case would re polymer, re melt polymer there to heal those mechanical defects. And, yeah. Do you ever hard bake past the glass transition temperature or do you not want to vitrify the photoresist? I think this temperature is above TT. Uh, so it, it does get refined. Yeah, because yeah. we want it to become really glassy, become really hard, so it can withstand the etch processing after it comes out. So it it seems it's typically close to the glass transition temperature of the resist, and we do deep UV UV. Exposure also to harden the resist to increase the survival. Process called lift off. What is lift off used for? Metal lines. Metal. Pattern, metal lines, right? So pattern, metal lines that connect. Ideally, what happens is we would put resist down, we would put metal all across. These colors are not coming through. And we should get rid of resist, and that leaves very fine lines with us. So they leave these, but this is ideal case. What actually happens is we have coverage of metal on for the contrast doesn't give us the edges which are perpendicular, right? So they give us slanted edges. And then metal covers everywhere, right? So metal would have some fine and thin presence at the edge as well, right? So even if we have high contrast resist, there will be still some that will be left behind. So once you get rid of resist, what we get is overhang, which means the line width is not uniform. The line has extra material which may result into shorts, which may come off later on, 
and result, fall somewhere in between two lines and make them short, which may get into oxide region or silicon region and result into electrical failure of those devices. We want to get rid of this. And what we get is our lines are not continuous. They might be, they might become wide or small. What we do is we do something called a chlorobenzene treatment, which makes photoresist hard at the top. What it results in into sort of a mushroom shape of resist where the metal falls without making those side walls. Right? So what we are in what we end up with. So it serves not only the metal lines are well defined, it gives us this solvent seeping place also to dissolve, resist and to remove metal from everywhere. Right? So it's called lift off and chlorobenzene treatment lift off. That's how we make those long lines. How do you control the overhang with how much it extends out? How much it extends out? Like that mushroom shape, how do you control it? We know then for how long dip in chlorobenzene, for how thick of resist will give us what kind of tolerance. Okay. Right? So these are very well established process and how long do you expose? Because chlorobenzene reacts with resist and makes it hard. Longer you do, the deeper it will go into resist. So the there will be a deeper layer of resist that will become hardened. It's your call that how deep you want to go. So, so that decreases the development rate there and, and just the top layer of the resist has reduced development rate. So what we get at the end is a very well defined height. Can, uh, can you use a uh, um, lift off other than metal? Yeah, you can use lift off for anything. It depends on if you want to make line or a feature, then you can do left off of almost anything. But why are we using paper, the metal material? Because if you want to etch metal, you want to use, you'll have to use much very rigorous recipes. You don't want to do that. Right? You can there is there can be another way you make a metal line and do lithography and etch metal from where you don't want it. That should have been Another way of doing it, right? Since uh, lithography is, uh, I mean, com compatible, I guess. Yeah, in that case, also you would do lithography and then you would etch away metal from where you don't want it, right? But etching metal is very, you, the, those reactants will be very vigorous. And you, you'll see, we use chemicals to etch metals. We do that, but they are very highly concentrated of assets that we use. Yeah. Why gold is expensive? Really? Because it doesn't react with other materials. It doesn't react with it. We Nobel call it Nobel Nobel metal, metal, right? But bad news, we can etch gold as well. The chemical, the mixture of chemicals, assets basically, they call aqua regia. Aqua, aqua water regia, I don't know what is that. So that's a very, very dangerous combination of sulfuric acid, hydrochloric acid, and I think nitric acid as well, which can etch my gold as well. So but those are expensive chemicals. So instead of doing etching of metal, I would rather do left off. Etching of finger should be easier than any other thing. Because etching of gold should be easier than any other thing. Because it doesn't react, you shouldn't stick on it. Yeah, that's another thing that should it, how does it stick to silica? We don't stick silica, gold directly on silica or silicon dioxide. We use a sticky layer. We use a very thin chrome or titanium layer, which sticks well both sides. Bonding, like bonding. Bonding? No, we, no. we evaporate. That's a sticky layer. We so evaporate. So whatever method we use, mostly it's evaporation, physical evaporation, so, or e-beam evaporation. So what we do is we always deposit a thin layer of titanium or chrome and then we deposit metal. 
So in any case, the bottom line is I can define those same lines using lithography and etching, right? Or I can define the same lines by doing lift off. Lift off, I, all I need is a solvent that can dissolve photoresist, right? Acetone can do that. But if I want to do etching of metal, it requires much more expensive and dangerous chemicals to do. We can do etching in ink with reactive ion etching as well, but then again, the recipe requires much dangerous and much expensive processes to do that. Right? So this will will be revisiting resist properties and all those over and over, but let's now focus on optic side of lithography. Right? Because we have this appreciation now that left off or, to, or left on lithography is not just optics or not just resist, they all come together. They have all, as a designer or as a process engineer, I have to know all those those, those things. The energy that I use, and what kind of resist I need, what are the issues with thickness, how do I apply resist, how do I do development. But what kind of light do I use and how do I register those patterns? And what does it take to get my light right for do, to do that? So from optics point of view, resolution, registration, CD, and throughput, these are the important things. So resolution is the how small of a feature size I can make, right? So minimum feature size that a technology can make. It's not CD. CD would be what we have discussed already before the rest of us join us. So CD is slightly different concept. So if you have to differentiate between CD and resolution, it should be clear. Now we align, we know technology, we know size, we know our, our mask, we know what we can produce with this, but what we actually get after development is your R registration, right? And that again is a factor of, of many things. So, and that has to be within tolerance of our previous, uh, whatever features were there from previous mass runs. And then we have to see that they are within precision, within accurate size. So if I have five micron feature and I'm out by 5 micron, I have my lithography is failed. So I have to make sure that size is accurate and it's within tolerance. So that's the difference between dimension control and registration. And how quickly can we get our wafers out? Right? From industry point of view, it's important to push as many wafers as quickly as we can. Can you explain a little more pattern registration and dimensional control? I think both of them is dealing with accuracy. Yeah, so one is, so registration, we are worried about the pattern which were there before. So we align our new mask, right, and then we expose. And we develop and then we see, are we on top of our previous? And we also see, uh, okay, we are on top, then we see our size of our feature is what we want it to be, right? That one is registration, the other is the device, the dimension of the feature. Is, is that in, within tolerance or not, right? So, i tell you, a, a machine with one micron error in registration is fine if, I, if my feature size is 10 micron. Right? It's just 10%. But if my feature size is 5 micron, my, my registration error is now 20%. So it keeps on going up. I have to inspect to see my registration is good. Now, both of these things depend on different things. My dimension control is, is an entirely uh, different, uh, has different issues in it if it's not coming the size you want, right? You know that. The internal reflection, resist, overexposure and underexposure, overdevelopment, underdevelopment can be other reasons. 
the, the pattern registration. Is it more difficult to pattern registration or damage? Think about it. If we go smaller in size, what is more important? Damage to control, but uh, even uh, pattern registration would be difficult because Pattern registration. So getting it exactly where the pre is, that has been automated now. That is, those machines can move in within nanometer precision, especially when we are doing step, step and repeat. Right? So it's the feature size which is important. So pattern registration is kind of standard, like you don't have to worry about it. Yeah, because what we do here is where we move things. But what industry does is where there is only the projection system is stepping. So your step is known. So you know the error in your step. So it's nothing where things are moving up and down. They're just moving directly. But what we do in contact lithography, we, where we have the light source come up and then and, and do the flash. So registration error probably not as important as the dimension control. Because dimension control has this whole lot of other issues where your wavelength is important, your resist internal refraction is it. So it's much more involved to do this right than have this right. We have seen this before, we'll revisit this. What ideally we want is this. That I have my reticle of mass. My light passes through only this region. What I should get is this step function. Right? Step function. But unfortunately, light travels in. How does light travel? Diverge. Diverge. How does light travel? It diffracts. How does light travel? Rays. 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 Light? So that's why we define those arrows to show light travels in rays. So those are when they travel through our uh, and, and construction and opening, what we get on the other side is diffraction, which is named after Bragg's diffraction, right? Where we have those lights going in all directions, especially at the edges. They don't give us this, they give us this. So they give us a maxima of light and density and trailing edges. And and when we push down the wavelength, those trailing edges get further apart. Right? So see, see that becoming more spread out from the center of image. How would that translate to Contrast. How would that translate to contrast? We have been grinding this concept for the last two lectures. Of course, there was a break in between. No, the contrast. Just look at this guy and see how it would contrast. If I push my wavelength down, what happens to my contrast? Decreases. 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 Right? Then increases. And, and by that, my What's happening to my resist ball is becoming inclined because now much more intensity is falling outside of where I wanted it to be, right? So this would translate into something where I wanted this to be like this and what I get is something like this just because much more light is, is hitting here also because of that concept called Bragg differential, right? So we'll look at this guy. So what would be the critical dimensions we'd be worried about? Thickness of resist? Diameters of holes? Widths of line? Spacing between lines? And for any feature, the angle of the resolution, right? The angle of of the exposed feature. All these things, or some of these things would define, or maybe one of those things will define a critical dimension. Right? So when I'm done with 
my exposure and developer, what do I look for? First thing, I want to go look for CD. If that has registered accurately or not. So, <coughs> this guy is going to, so if, if I don't get my, my light to have as close of my profile as a step junction, I will screw up one of those. Right? Why does it happen? It happens by light which have two components, E and B. And as they travel in x-axis, they are, what are they doing? Orthogonal to each other. They are orthogonal to each other and? Oscillating. Oscillating, right? So they are, if one is maximum, the other one is? The one is maximum to but in opposite direction. The opposite direction. So they are orthogonal. In, in 90 apart. So, so they are, if they are in phase, they should change same, right? So they, they, if one is at maximum, the other one is also at maximum, unless there is a polarization, where one will go out of sync. But E and B, so one is, how do we define E and B? Electric field and magnetic field. Electric and magnetic field. So both of them undergo changes. Once they travel through a slit, an opening, and what we call that? Heigham's source. So we call, so what we get is this kind of diffraction. Change color. So they travel and once they go through a slit, the straight line behavior changes. This is called Huygens principle and this simplifies our understanding of light going through a slit. So after the light goes through a slit, what we get is a profile, something of intensity which looks like this, right? And these these ripples are basically result of what? Interference. Interference, right? Because now, instead of a straight line, we are seeing multiple sources <coughs> emitting the light in different directions. And they result into maxima and minima, local maxima and local minima. And we can model these arrows as independent light sources because one light is now going in every direction so they are then called secondary waves or wavelets from the from coming from that aperture how do they restrict or how do they come into play with what we are doing we are doing many many slits in our mass right so these are all small openings transparent opening the light goes through so not just the, so this is that discussion come later on that how small of a feature can we make with respect to the wavelength. But before that, we are now having these number of sources of light of wavelengths which would be now interfering with each other. And what we get on the surface will be something which will have this kind of shape and as we go, as we move the mask away from the wafer, these become larger wavelengths. So these interferences become large in wavelength. So what we get at the at certain distance from there is what is called Fraunhofer region in optics is instead of that step junction, a uh, distribution which results from interference of those individual light sources. Right? So 
Our image is now a broad central region instead of a step junction, a step function. How does that change? That changes everything. That changes our resolution limit, right? Which is defined by the like criterion depth of focus pitch limit. How quickly, how often can we repeat it? It messes up our resolution. Because this is general idea how we do that. So we condense light. Now we have opaque regions, transparent regions. We push them through objective lens, gets to resist. Right? And when we have all these individual light sources, they are going to result into a superposition of waves. Right? So at any point, we'll be getting multiple rays coming from multiple sources. Right? So it's not a straight line now. So if I'm a point on the wafer, I'm getting these all sorts of rays coming from different point sources. Make sense? Too much optics? Get out of it soon. So, but the, the idea is that this will result into these specific relations that depend on the numerical aperture of the medium, right? Because the, of those point sources of light. We have seen this before, right? So, where resolution limit the smallest feature that can be made with the technology depends on K1, which is a constant for specific photoresist, numerical aperture, and lambda. So ideally, if you want to make resolution li limit small, we should push for smaller lambda. Right? Right? Wrong. So we to push this down. And numerical aperture is a function of, of index and acceptance angle, which is the from that source, what is the angle, maximum angle through which we get the light that matters for the interference. Right? So this is that angle from that source, what we call as the acceptance angle. So wavelets interfere constructively only when m is plus minus 1, 2, 3. They give us a maximum profile for 5 lambda, for 5 times of the wavelength. Now, if I push the wavelength down, what's going to happen to the feature size? We can make smaller features, right? But this is, yeah, this is going to stay the same. Then. Whatever intensity we get from that, it's going to, relation is going to stay the same for that. So we still get interference effects even with x rays? If we can have slit where x rays can see that slit, yes. But the question is, is there something that can? Actually, you can see as a slit. No, they just pass through everything. Don't they? So even with lead, you know, with a slit, you if you have that metallic uh, something that's opaque for X-rays, yes, you will get that. Right? But that, if you are talking about thinking about photolithography or lithography, then you need those special masks to get that image. Out. They're very expensive. So you applies to electrons also, if I'm not mistaken? Yeah, anything that travels. No, no, you can't find anything that's opaque to electrons. Because even lithography is mainly done by contact breaking. You can't find anything that's opaque to electrons. Oh, there are some things I mean, which are opaque. Not, uh, so we, we use those stencils, yeah. mass, to do electron lithography also. That's good. We have stencils or masks for iron also. Yeah, but then the question would be a different question. So right now we are talking about photolithography, where we have these lenses, which are made of glass, and we know their optical properties, and you know how to control them. If you are shrinking the 
and then we'll see what happens if we push the wavelength really down, what's going to happen to the optics. We can't use transparent optics at all. We can't use glass optics at all. And the reason is the band gap energy becomes almost the same as the, those wavelengths. So we'll see what happens. So numerical aperture is a lens capability to collect all those lights, of course. Depends on this guy alpha, which is the angle that you can accept as many in that region, and n, which is the refractive index. So this is something, I think, one of you have chosen this for the paper, immersion lithography, where they use liquids to change refractive index. So now you have medium, which is air, and you have one for that. Now if you can change n, in that equation, you would want numerical aperture to become small or large to reduce W min? Small? No, large. Right? Large. It's inversely proportional. Want to make N of the numerical aperture to be a large number. Not possible with air, there's so a certain limit, but if you change the medium with something that has, has higher refractive index, we can get that. Right? So, it is 0 0.2 to 0 0.7 for projection aligners. And this is just way of showing that what are we getting when it's passing through mask and what do we get at the surface of the mask. So Does the concept of numerical aperture apply when we're doing contact printing? Like is it, does it degrade to like infinity or one or something? Do you have medium between when you are doing contact to the I suppose, well, photoresist, but yeah. Photoresist, you just transfer your energy right away, right there. I see. Contact printing. So, so you kind of need a lens to even apply. Yeah. This, what you see is what you get. There's no diffraction. It's right there, it starts right. So probably your internal reflection, reflection of resist might be more well, uh, prominent. I see. This guy. Right, so how can we estimate the resolution of the, the system? So this is called an airy disk. So we have been looking at those things in two dimensional, but actually it's a three dimensional thing, right? So that the maxima or minima, the distribution is a basically a three dimensional thing. So what you get is a point which is maxima, and then everything is is going down around it. Now, if I have my feature which was very well defined, a square, but what I'm going to get is probably a circle if I'm pushing down the, the wavelength. So there'll be so. I, what is relay criterion? It's that the two images will be just resolved when their airy disk are separated and their energy between them falls to zero. The intensity between them falls to, to zero. So a point source comes out as a disk, as a region where you have high intensity then around it. So pitch becomes an issue then because how fast you can make two features will become a, a, a problem because of the interference in between. So you can't discriminate between those two. So that's degrading a resolution. So it's not just the feature size, it's the pitch also. How often can we repeat this? There's another concept, coherence, and what happens with diffraction, the feature is shifted from where we want it to be. And there's a feature, there's a, this quantity called sigma, which should be zero for fully coherent, and it's very large than one when it's called incoherent. So the idea is that everything that falls here is what matters at 
sigma equal to 0. But that something that follows away from that still imparts energy. So this is what results into that a disk shape behavior. So what do modern steppers do? They adjust for coherence. They have sigma around 0.6 and 0.8 for liners, lines and 0.3 and 0.5 for holes. So that number is, is much more controlled now with, with this modern things, modern steppers. Okay, um, can you explain more about why the coherence, I think they are using different concepts uh, like the traditional coherence. So why that is important? When light is traveling in every direction, so you want that region where all the rays are coherent. They transfer all the energy for your pattern to get transferred. So that's the region in front of the mass where your sigma will be zero. So if you go away from that, that number will increase. Just a Factor to define the diffraction. Okay. So it's more related to energy transfer. It's always we. Why do we want to focus? We, we always want to have maximum energy transfer. So that distribution is basically the intensity. Right. So it's always this intensity that we want it to be step function on the on the surface of the wafer. So another factor is depth of focus. So we have probably discussed this a little bit. So depth of focus is the tolerable distance in which we can get the, the image to be registered within and get the energy transfer to occur. But generally, it's in a layman language, that's the, the having things in focus, different planes in focus, right? We want with the with the multiple layers and because of different heights of features, we want the light to be fairly large in depth of focus. So we want depth of focus to be large. Level. But what we see is if you push lambda down to get smaller feature size we are getting a depth of focus also compromised, right? And if we are trying to get a numerical approach larger, we are getting a depth of focus again becoming small, but up to a limit. What should be the rate, the limit on numerical approach that it, it adds up constructively to depth of focus? Okay, let me say it again. What should be the limit on numerical aperture that would be beneficial for depth of focus? Now, and what is good for depth of focus? To have it large. So what should be the limit on numerical aperture? Numerical aperture is a number. Right? So what should be the limit on that number to support a larger depth of focus? Close to? Close to? equal to or less than 1. Because, because square of a number smaller than would be even smaller number. But if you go above 1, then it's becoming a large number. Then 1 resulting into reducing depth of focus. So if you have given a problem where you have features at different height, and you know the maximum height of a feature in a, on a substrate, that is your depth of focus. That's your, that, your, that is your minimum depth that you want to transfer or register your pattern on that way. Does it make sense? So if you, if you know the, the height of the, the, the tallest feature on your wafer, that is your depth of focus. That is your minimum depth of focus. You have to have depth of focus larger than that. Does it make sense? So we do run into this problem where the numerical aperture that we work so hard to increase is too large. You will be compromising the depth of focus. I see. 
right? So yeah, so having numerical aperture large isn't that a messy situation. Is don't it, know which way to go. Is it similar to having your f stop too large to too open in, in your in a regular camera? F stop. F stop is the aperture of the camera where you know if, if you could get to a lower number. Generally, the, yeah. So generally, would be not expert or not expert. When we are doing a portrait, we do, we do something called micro setting where everything else goes. Yeah, that, that actually opens the. Uh, yeah, but when we but when we put the camera on the mountain setting, then everything is in focus, right? You can take. So I think it's called wide yeah, lens or something with where, where no the whole thing comes in focus. Even things close and far, they all are in focus. So I don't know what is the actual setting there. But it makes it more like a pinhole when you put it in the mountain setting. It probably, it makes probably. I'm, I'm not sure what would be. But ideally, you want depth of focus to be a, a large number. Right? We want it to be at least the height of the tallest feature. Right? Tallest feature you mean on that layer or in general the tallest feature? No, on that layer where you are doing lithography, whatever you have on the wafer, you have some feature which is the tallest. So when I say tallest, it's not again just from here to here, it may be something. So now this would be the height that you want to cater for. Right? So if you have a, a feature which is a trench, now and you have to want to transfer some pattern there. So now this is your minimum depth of focus. So it makes sense because if it's smaller than that, then registration here or registration here will be messed up. And why is that again? Our light will not be in focus, not be in focus enough to transfer the pattern, to register the pattern accurately in size, or to expose the pattern completely, expose resist completely at that space. Make sense? This is along the optical axis or which an image has resist profiles and language that remain with its specifications. Right? So it has to be within 20% of the peak intensity. Because if you go above and that, we are basically losing energy. And we, we had that picture there that you have this. If if you are here or you are here, you are basically losing energy. Right? So this is where the maximum energy transfer would occur. At this plane is where it would occur. So within 20 percent is where we can get it exposed. If we don't get it exposed, what do we call that? Underexposed. What if, if, if a feature is underexposed, how is it going to show up after development? Blurred. You'll still see resist there in that feature. So it will be exposed maybe halfway, maybe 90 percent, not all the way. So you will still have resist left behind it, right? So it's called underexposed. You might want to keep on doing development, but it's not going to do anything because that, that, feed, that resist at, at that certain after certain thickness is not exposed at all. It's not going to dissolve. If you're going to keep on developing more and more, yes, it will be dissolved, but then you will be opening your walls up. Right, so that's what is called over development. So depth of focus is fairly restricted number between half of on either side of left over and square. So, so I think the depth of focus can be controlled by um, the length between lens and the string. Right? Yeah. So basically. That is a number which is which is set for a particular wavelength. So yes, what you're saying is distance between these two should be a factor there, right? So if we can control the length, that would be much better. So we do that to focus it already, uh, right? But the question is that wavelength, how above or top can we still get our registration to work. Of course, we control their distance to focus it to start with. Isn't that what we do to, when we are looking at through an optical microscope, what do we move? 
we are using moving the distance between what objective and the slides. That's what we do to bring it into focus. But now, question is depth of focus is something which is on either side of that focus depth, right? A focus distance is that depth of both sides of that plane. It makes sense. Should be. It's a tricky thing, but needs the, your vision on to understand depth of focus. So you focus it by changing that distance. But now this is the distance on either side of that plane where you have focused it, where you can get registration to work. So then you play with those and you get this guy, right? So this now tells you playing with lambda and k is not always the only solution that you get. Not because only this reason, but there are more reasons. We'll see why if we can't, don't want to push lambda too small. So this is something where we can define a number for lambda and play around with these. So one of the thing is that how, what is the largest numerical aperture you want to live it to still have reasonable depth of focus. So this is just to give an idea that you can have, one of them can be in focus, but others will can then go out of focus. So this is intensity horizontal distance and you are seeing defocusing. So there's, if you are not out of focus, you get this guy, but once you go out of focus, yes, you get the intensity to transfer, but then your pattern size is also going to increase in width, right? Does it make sense? So you can, this is the minimum that you want, because if you don't have it, your width is going to get screwed up. may not get it developed at all. If you get it, your width will be out of the numbers, right? So that is just showing a feature that we have to make on two levels, right? Above oxide and, and the level of the wafer. Make sense? How do numerical aperture affect our defocus in depth, depth of focus? So it's in microns, if you are going numerical aperture from 0 0.3 to 0 0.4 to 0 0.6, what's happened with my depth of focus? And I'm going from 0 0.3 to 0 0.4 to 0 0.6, what's it's happening to my depth of focus? It's decreasing. It's decreasing, right? So, which means now I don't have too much room, right? Make sense? So have to find the optimum numerical aperture. Uh, now that we are doing shallow junctions, does that matter so much? Junction, shallow junctions? Uh, like the, the, the source is very close to the... So you, of course, you, if you have, if your depth of focus is, is not reasonable enough and your feature is on that, you are making contact to source, for example. Your, you will get exposure which will be much more wide than what you would have got with this guy. See the intensity? You have much more intensity now for, I'm, so, do you see what I'm saying? So for this guy, now you have your intensity up here, then this guy where you would have your intensity here. So now your resistance is going to get to the, yeah. And it's going to, if this is the threshold, maybe you, you'll have a wider line, a wider square exposed where you wanted a small one to be exposed. So maybe you are shooting for 1 micron, but turning 1 micron by 1 micron, you'll get 1.2 micron by 1.2 micron. Make sense? Unless you focus on that level, that then maybe you'll be getting out of focus somewhere else, right? And one to two micron is small. It's small, so that your feature will be obviously the same scale. And and now, 
think about this twist right now, what we are considering is we are not even touching lambda. Now, if you push lambda down as well, this becomes even more prominent. Right? right? So, this, these are two, three questions, and I would want you to know these equations. Remember those equations, because they define the relation of light and optics, and what do we get as we get it. So there will always be trade-off between lambda, numerical aperture, and CG size. Always be trade-off, yeah. So that's why then we have to come up with out-of-box thinking, which you guys are hopefully doing right now. Or not to solve these, these things, and what else can be done. So right, we need to find, again, this was meant for tablet where I could do. So this simple interactions, I'll probably have these for homework too. Simple interactions of depth of focus and pitch limit. How do we define them? So with pitch limit, the idea is that we don't only want the acceptable line width, we want to have acceptable sidewall angle as well. Right? So we can resolve two lines closely closer to each other. Right. And this is what is showing that if we increase the exposure, our lines are becoming much more angled, so, which essentially results Minus. into them interfering, not exposing the whole thing. Are these cross-sectional images? These are images taken at an angle. So if that is your reference, these are taken from an angle. So it's kind of the top view. So this guy is the top. No, this these are side images. Cross section is something where you cut across, but these are side images. So the wafer taken from a side. So focus exposure process window. So now we have to then define something called boson plot. So this is done by for a specific technology, these are plotted out. It's a three-dimensional plot, right? Where you have two entities on X and Y. The third one is written next to the plot. What does it tell us? It tells us what is the depth of focus we can get for what energy to get what line width. So boson plot is used to define what we call focus exposure matrix because we not only want to expose the line to get acceptable line width, we want to expose to have the walls to be straight, right? And we want to have respectable amount of thickness of results left behind. If you miss any of those, we are will be out of the size, but will be out of the, the critical dimension of the feature. Make sense? Why all these things will impact? So if you have more energy, what's gonna happen? The line width increases. So see how does it change? Changes from this, so this is 160, it goes this way. How does it change? Our line width will go up, but our focal position is becoming smaller. It's minus 1.4 to 0 0.8. So it's increasing on this side. So, decreasing with so that's on both sides. The focal, you have to see depth of focus on both sides of the plane, plus and minus. Which is right. the line is decreasing with decreasing. So this is probably the region where your exposure <coughs> will work, right? Because apart away from that plane, you will lose. So depth of focus. Now you have to think three dimensions. I have this plane where I'm impinging my line. Right? has to deliver energy. And then there is some 
thickness, which is in minus, this is in plus. I, I, I'll get only in certain distance, I'll get my energy transferred. Right? At that point, I can make certain width of the line. Cannot make it bigger or smaller than that. Okay? Now I increase my energy. I can make a bigger line and I can make it have my depth of focus is also increasing. Now I can do from here to here, slightly larger than that. So if you put a line here and you say, okay, this is acceptable intensity, then I can make that line. Does that make sense? Have to feel it in three dimensions. So I'm changing my intensity, energy, my depth of focus is changing, right? The range which is valid is changing because if I go too far away from that plane, my line width is becoming zero. Essentially, I'm not getting any exposure. Right? In this case as well, if I'm getting too far away, my line is becoming too wide. So if I'm going too far away from my plane of focus, my line is becoming wide. Now let's go back to this this guy. So these three things, intensity will give me acceptable line width with acceptable height with acceptable angle of the ball. This is what is called focus exposure window. Uh, acceptable resist thickness post development. So after development, I still am left be behind with acceptable res thickness of the resist. But you don't want resist to stay after I want my resist to stay where it is supposed to stay. Oh, it means where it is supposed to stay. In this case, it was supposed to stay here. It was supposed to stay the whole thickness. But because my lines, my, my walls have become too angled, I'm losing my resist thickness. You have to digest this guy. How long does it take? You need to understand this part. You will not have to, as process engineer, you, this will be established for a specific lithography machine. But you might have to measure this up. But given this plot, you should be able to know your process condition. Depth of focus. So if you are given something like that and you have something like this, you need to figure out what energy will be you would want to use to get that feature. Of course, in that feature, it will be given the height and the minimum feature size. Make sense? It will be just a very small window there. Right? So if I, what is, this, this is your depth of focus, and this is your line width. So it defines you what is the process window that you can work with, the specific energy of the, of the exposure. I'm using energy, exposure, dose, all things to mean how long that energy will be exposed, right? The middle line, that straight line, what is that? Say? That's axis. So that is just a line to show axis, to show flatness of this axis here. Right? Because if you don't have that, you would think this is straight. But this is changing. Right? So boson plant is important to figure out focus exposure process window. Now, going back to that question of alignment and registration. We overlay two features by alignment, but once we get a transfer, we get errors, which come from alignment error, which would be how close we had brought it mechanically, and then what happens when the light gets exposed. So this is basically the accuracy of positioning, how accurately we can get it to 
transfer on the wafer within tolerance. Right? So it can be for a for an for an edge we have this much distance that we can go, right? Maybe again for between two out two what you call squares outside and inside square we might have certain limitation that we can live with. So these are all these numbers which we would have to know once we done once we are done with our exposure. What happens if we miss register? It can result into failures. What are the failures? What can happen here? If I go from here to here Electrically, what's going to happen? Electrically, what is going to happen? Now, first, understand what is happening physically. So, there is, I'm supposed to, I'm like contact, I'm supposed to cover this whole thing, right? So, I have this area and contact. But what happens is I cover just half of it. Now, what is going to happen? to my contact area. I, I just covered half of it. What's going to happen to my contact area? That's my first question. It's half. It's become half. And my <coughs> resistance is what? Increase. How do we define resistance? What's the formula for resistance? Resistance with double. I'm asking, OK, what's my formula so for resistance? Like by length divided by rho L over A. We all know that R equals rho L over A. So my area has half, which means my resistance has doubled. My resistance gets doubled, what happens? If we are this if we have designed a circuit to withstand certain to offer certain resistance and that resistance doubles, what happens to that machine, to that equipment? Heats up, right? So there's power loss, there's energy loss. What does that heat result into? Failure, right? So ultimately, it's, it's I'm going to burn away. I'm going to burn down this contact. First step, contact resistance increases, right? Which means there's much more voltage drop occurring in that device, which would mean it may burn up one day, right? So results into to failure. Technical word is failure, failure of device. So mean time to failure. There is a specific term used for for IC. It's called MTTF, which defines how quickly it's gonna fail. So if we have too much of misalignments, we're gonna get very small MTTF. I miss my tablet. It's just burned on me. Fan is not burning. So wait. So this can do that. Or in this case, we have a gate, but since we are not covering it, we're going to get short. We're going to have current passing through from one to the other. And what so we, loss? huh? Loss. Field outside. So we do certain tricks to do these, to overcome these problems of registration. We'll probably talk about it next lecture. So there are certain tricks which we do to make our registration to accurately depict the end product. Those tricks may not be, those tricks may be sometimes overshooting a feature size. So making a feature bigger, or putting some, some boxes and edges so when we register it, we get sharp corner. So there's multiple. We might place some dummy feature somewhere, so we, and we'll expose them just to have a uniform process going on. So this multi many things what we do in to may have a good registration. So we'll look at those next Tuesday. Questions. Again, Monday is the deadline, right? Blackboard is preferred mode of communication for that chapter. For that Monday till noon. Term paper. No, 30 minute afternoon. So, all right? Questions? I'll see you on Tuesday.